stem. All right. Until a child uh, normalizes, develops their sensory function, and until they've developed global neurological function, which will permit them to engage in an active play. Essentially, all children are kind of stuck with stimulating themselves through sensory play. So, you know, typical children will, will rock, they'll suck their thumbs, uh, you know, they'll do some visual stimming, uh, some different kinds of tactile stimming. You know, we perceive this as, as being normal in a, a typical uh, baby. Uh, however, in our children within the spectrum, the sensory dysfunction and resulting uh, sensory addictive behaviors uh, become consuming. Essentially, if you look at your child and look at those quote-unquote stims, those uh, abnormal behaviors, if you will, those weird behaviors, essentially what you're seeing your child doing is playing with what's broken within sensory channels. Uh, at the top of the list typically are visual issues. And some visual issues are, are pretty obvious and others are not so obvious. Uh, to understand the visual issues, you need to understand the difference between what's called central macular vision and peripheral vision. All children begin life primarily using their peripheral vision. And then they develop their central macular vision. All right, if you were to look at a, a spot across the room from where you're sitting, you could probably see a area, uh, you know, maybe a foot, 18 inches in diameter, where you see clearly and see detail. And that is your, what's called your macular field or your central detail vision. The rest of what you see that's out around all the sides is your peripheral vision and your peripheral vision is not clear and detailed as is your central vision. Visual stimming, visual debilitating sensory addictive behaviors, uh, essentially are children playing with that peripheral vision which is enhanced. Children with normal vision do not stim, visually stim, simply because it doesn't work. Right, visual stims are playing with the peripheral vision. And somewhere, as I say, are obvious. You know, if you have a child who is flapping their hands up around their heads, that's obviously a visual stim. The children who are playing and shaking sticks or strings or whatever, that's obviously visual peripheral stim. Kids who like to spin around, that's peripheral visual stim. Uh, all of these things that the children engage in, they're playing with that enhanced peripheral vision, and unfortunately, the more they do that, the more they are strengthening the peripheral vision, and the more difficult they're making for development of the central vision. And sadly, your central macular vision is what you use for learning. You know, it's your central macular vision that permits you to look at and attend to someone's face. It's your central macular vision that permits you to look at the page in a book. You know, many of our children with these issues, rather than actually looking at what's on a page, <clears throat> they tend to flip the pages, all right, and they're attracted to the movement and the edges of the flipping pages. All right, so your peripheral vision picks up movement and edges. One of the more subtle visual debilitating sensory addictive behaviors is children actually scan edges. So they don't actually have to be physically flipping or moving something. You know, you watch your child's eye gaze and you'll see often that that eye gaze is scanning the edges in the room. Right? Now the reason why I refer to these as sensory debilitating addictive behaviors is that essentially what is going on, the child is playing with what is broken in a sensory channel. As they do that, that play or stim as it's called is actually producing endorphins. And endorphins, if you will, are filled with brain chemicals. And the children's brain literally become addicted to these behaviors. Now if you if you watch the children who are on the spectrum who are really severe, you know, you can see that the children would rather stim than, than eat, all right? It is such a powerful addiction. 
And you'll also see, you know, with most of the kids across the spectrum, as soon as you stop engaging them, they tend to immediately go into one of these debilitating sensory addictive behaviors. Unfortunately, the more they engage in addictive behaviors, the more addictive they become. And as many of you have found, you may succeed in stopping them from doing one, but they quickly pick up on doing another one. All right, so that becomes a very significant issue. So we need to not only stop the, the addictive behavior by keeping the kids engaged, we also have to work aggressively at normalizing the sensory channels so that it is not, if you will, fun to do that anymore. The brain isn't attracted to the behavior. In the case of the visual issues, it's a matter of developing the central macular vision, right? the central detail vision. The stronger that gets, the less that peripheral issue is such a big deal for the kids and, and the, you know, they start moving away from that addictive behavior. Uh, one of the greatest therapeutic tools, fortunately, for developing macular vision is actually the TV. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about television later in terms of how it can be used not only in terms of development and treatment of the central macular vision, but also as, a, as an excellent learning tool for our kids. But at the top of the list of what we, we do with, with all the children within the spectrum is identify what is broken in each of these sensory channels, work to normalize the sensory channel, and keep the child engaged and away from the sensory addictive behaviors. Now, these addictive behaviors can involve any of the senses and senses in combination. Uh, if your child has auditory issues, which are almost universal with our kids, uh, you hear tonal play where they will make different sounds, vocal sounds, and stim with that. They will tap things, do different things to produce sounds that are right on the edge of, of, of irritation for them. Uh, one of the issues that we have is that Hearing does not develop kind of globally across the spectrum. Hearing develops in a very frequency-specific way, meaning you can have a narrow range of frequencies you can hear well. You may have another range of frequencies that are overstated that you're hypersensitive to. You may have other frequencies that are understated that you do not process well enough. All of these things impair the development of receptive language and expressive language, speech. All right, so the auditory issues are right up there in terms of importance with the visual issues and you know are certainly one of the most common issues. A lot of the kids, you know, will demonstrate that they have some sound sensitivities. Those are often fairly easy to identify, but what you cannot see are the understated frequencies that they do not process. So essentially everything they tend to hear <clears throat> is to some degree distorted, making the development of receptive and particularly expressive language very difficult. Uh, a number of years ago, we helped develop uh, something called the listening program. The listening program was an outgrowth of my working with sound therapy uh, programs since the early 70s when I first uh, discovered Dr. Tomatis in Paris. But we have utilized literally every uh, sound training program, auditory training program that exists. And currently the state of the art there is, is the listening program which we employ. The kids can also engage in uh, tactile stim. Uh, you know, your kids like feeling, feeling edges of things, who like rubbing things that are soft or things that are, are, are hard and rough. You know, we have kids who like, you know, rubbing their father's faces and feeling their beards. Uh, again, like any other channel, they will do this. Uh, sadly, many parents perceive this as being simply a soothing thing that the children do and actually encourage it. And again, if you encourage any of these things, you're, you're encouraging addiction. And do the kids like it? Absolutely. They like it just like a drug addict likes his drugs. 
doesn't mean it's good for them. All right, there are also stims that involve odors. There are stims that involve tastes. All right, so all of these all of these areas are incredibly important. Because if the brain is engaged, <clears throat> if the brain is directed toward sensory addictive behaviors, the brain is not going to be directed toward development and changing and moving the child on. So number one, we keep the child engaged virtually 24-7, and we work to normalize all the sensory channels. Now the next piece that has to happen is something called sequential processing. <clears throat> sequential processing is something that develops in every human being. And essentially, sequential processing represents how many pieces of information you can take in sequentially, in a row. And essentially what this translates to is how much can you see and understand, how much can you hear and understand, and with what complexity can you think? All right, so this is a very, very big deal. Uh, if we look at the difference in function between typical children between a year of age, and two, and two and three, and three and four, and four and five, those dramatic, dramatic changes we see in global function are primarily a reflection of improvement development of this sequential processing. All right, and sequential processing translates into short-term memory, working memory, and global neurological function. All right, literally it determines the complexity with which you can think. Now if we have a child who's severely involved on the spectrum, we may have a child who doesn't process a single piece of information well. And what they do process is probably more visual than auditory. Uh, for example, for a child to process a single auditory piece of information, we generally think they need to process and understand and follow a one-step direction. So for example, if you could tell your child, touch your nose, and they could touch their nose without a visual cue, you could tell your child to clap their hands without a visual cue, and they would do it. A child can process one piece, which is essentially equates to what we would typically see with about a one-year-old child. If you could say to the child two random things, like say blue and green, touch your ear, then your nose, jump up and down and then clap your hands, then we would say their sequential, auditory sequential processing is at a two. And this equates roughly with the global function of a two-year-old. When they can follow a three-step direction, then we're sequencing a three. Relative to language development, our typical understanding is most children who sequence a one come out with the occasional word. Now that word that just kind of pops out and you might not hear it again for, for a month, that child typically is processing one piece. When the child can sequence two pieces, we start getting some functional language and the child is speaking in one, you know, single words, some couplets, and some initial three-word phrases. Now, with our children on the spectrum, it becomes a little more difficult to assess where they are with their sequential processing relative to a language function because they, they cheat the system a little bit. Our, our children with the spectrum tend to take in chunks of auditory information awfully, often associated with a piece of visual information. For example, you know, a lot of our kids have what we call video speak. And video speak is where they actually take words or lines or phrases from movies and videos and utilize those for communication. All right, so you might have a child who's coming out with a three or four word phrase from video speak or that they have learned by rote when they maybe are only processing two pieces. Right. 
but for them to actually generate, create functional language themselves, it equates directly to where the sequential processing is. Typically, we need to get sequential processing up to about a three before a child is able, is able to engage in appropriate independent developmental play. Now, this is a big issue in that if you're trying to keep the child engaged all day and they're not yet to that level of a three, you know, it, it, they really are dependent upon you or someone helping you to keep them actively engaged because they're not able to do it themselves. Virtually anything a child is doing independently on the spectrum prior to processing three pieces of information, they're probably stimming, they're probably engaging in a debilitating sensory addictive behavior on one level or another. Okay, so this is, this is a very, very, very big deal. So part of what we do, again, is we start off identifying the sensory dysfunctions, normalizing the sensory channels, redirecting them, stopping them from engaging in debilitating sensory addictive behaviors, and then we start working on the sequential processing and developing auditory and visual sequential processing. Uh, the development of the sequential processing is largely a matter of determining, number one, where the child actually is with their auditory and visual processing and then providing lots of opportunities to move it up another notch. You know, from the beginning, it means teaching the child to follow some one-step directions. And when we have, you know, typically a child who can follow about 25 one-step directions, then we start randomly combining those directions, working on twos. We also have uh, CDs that help train the brain to anticipate the next piece. So we have these CDs that help get the kids from a one to a two and a two to a three and a three to a four and so forth. So we engage a number of different mechanisms to attempt to improve that auditory sequential processing, visual sequential processing. And relative to our kids on the spectrum, the auditory is particularly more significant than the visual. Uh, with rare, rare exception, most of the kids on the spectrum are much stronger visually than they are auditorily, which, which creates some, some problems all of its own, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But building, understanding, building, developing the, the sequential processing is a huge issue. Now, I mentioned that the kids tend to be much stronger visual learners than auditory learners. They also are stronger visualizers than conceptualizers, meaning our kids tend to think in pictures rather than in words. And this creates an issue in that if you're thinking in pictures and not in words, this makes the development of language uh, particularly difficult. So as we move along with the children, and again, we're normalizing the sensory function, we're developing the sequential processing, we have to go through a process where we move them from being visualizers to conceptualizers, move them from thinking almost entirely in pictures to a point where they can think in pictures and in words, change, change that balance. Now, an understanding of where the specific child is in time relative to these various pieces uh, helps us determine not only what we need to do therapeutically to normalize all these pieces, but it also tells us what we need to do developmentally, educationally, to educate the child. Uh, for example, when we have the children, um, the lower processing, I discovered uh, doing some research way back in the early 70s that I could get, get children on the spectrum to visually attend if I rapidly flashed information at them. Meaning specifically, I could hold a picture in front of the child and the child would look at the edges of the paper and not actually look at the picture on the paper. But I discovered if I rapidly flashed the information, 
and has had actual flashcards rapidly flashing them at like half second intervals. The movement of the flashing cards would attract the child and then the child would start attending with their central vision to what was on the cards. So rapidly presenting information, <clears throat> first in terms of just pictures to develop receptive language and then actually words to develop reading. Reading is one of the best tools we have to help develop, develop the language in the auditory sequential processing. And very early on, we start working on developing reading because it is such a valuable tool for us in terms of the cognitive function, uh, receptive language, and expressive language, as well as obviously an educational tool to teach the mother information. But uh, so in terms of, of education, you know, we start off often with flashcards and we take the children also and we use that strong macular stimuli, the television, as an educational tool. We use the television to actually help develop the central macular vision and then we create a lot of therapeutic videos. Therapeutic videos essentially are creating videos to teach a child specific things. The specific thing can be modeling, you know, how to eat with a spoon. The specific thing can be modeling how to go up to someone and say hello. All right, the specific thing can be review of their word cards or we use expressive language cards and receptive language cards. Uh, the TV can be an incredibly strong medium uh, once we teach a child to use that macular vision well enough that they can take advantage of it. One of the negatives relative to television is perseveration. Many of your children, once they discover television, want to perseverate with television and videos. That is, they want to watch the same thing over and over and over again. For some children, it's so specific that they'll have little second-long pieces on videos that they like and they'll, they'll rapidly learn how to keep rewinding a video so they can keep watching that same thing over and over again. With the exception of therapeutic videos, we really don't want to have the child watching the same thing more than a few times. You're actually better off renting videos than you are buying videos. If you buy them, the, the tendency is going to be to watch them too often. And the danger there gets into this area of visualization and conceptualization. If you watch the eye gaze of most of our children on the spectrum when they are thinking, the majority of the time their eye gaze goes up and to the side. You also see that when the child is not engaged and he's not doing some obvious stimming, you'll see that eye gaze go up and to the side. And essentially what is happening as a child is doing that is the child is in fact visualizing. And many of our kids, if they watch a video more than two or three times,